I would like you to use your imagination to travel back in history to 627 AD, a very critical date in the spiritual and moral history of Great Britain. King Edwin of Northumbria has summoned a special council of warriors, wise men, and priests. And he summons them because the king is of two minds as to whether or not to accept Christianity. It's been presented passionately to him by Paulinus, one of Columbus' missionaries. And the king is wavering between two options. So he asks his wise men and his warriors and priests what they think of this new faith, Christianity. Then one of the warriors stands up and addresses the gathering in a speech which has become famous down through the centuries. He likens a human life to the flight of a sparrow through the great banqueting hall in which they all sit for supper. Now you have to picture the hall. Here it is, this rather primitive building with two openings, one at either end. The fire is blazing in the middle. The hall is warm and everyone sits around for supper. And outside, the winter storms are raging. Suddenly, through one of the doors, a sparrow flies and begins to circle around the hall for a few moments. And then it flies out the other door. And while it's in the hall, the sparrow is safe and warm and free from the chaos and the storm outside but then it vanishes from the summer of the banqueting hall back out into the tempestuous unknown of winter. Then the warrior, after having drawn this mental image, ends by saying, so is this human life here and now. It's like the sparrow that flies through the banqueting hall. We don't know where it's going to and we don't know where it's come from. We're uncertain of everything. If, therefore, this new doctrine can teach us something more certain, it seems justly to deserve to be followed. And the speech is decisive. And King Edwin accepts the Christian faith. And the consequences of that choice for Western culture and civilization are beyond measure. But do you see how skillfully that warrior plays on the emotions of the people? He plays on the emotions of those men gathered there as they think about the brevity of life, the mystery of life, the sheer impermanence of life. It's like the sparrow that flies in is there for just a few moments, then it flies out again. And that is what our life is like. A few spins around the banqueting hall, and then we're gone. We've all experienced the anxiety associated with human existence and mortality and change. Much as we go on from day to day as if tomorrow stretch out before us without end. In the depths of our heart and mind, we know our own impermanence. We know our own mortality. The writer of the Psalms expresses it like this. You sweep us away. We are like a dream, like grass that is renewed in the morning. In the evening, it fades and withers. Haven't you wished during times of great joy or inter in intimate conversation or inner peace, or when it seems like you're in just the right church with just the right people, that time would stand still, stuck in these pleasant grooves of life. If only it could last. If only I could stop the course of inexorable change and physical decay. If only I could make this moment last forever. But we can't. We know life is impermanent. We know life is transitory. But in the good moments of life, we wish this time could last forever. The writer to the Hebrews 
John read it for us. That writer says this, For here we have no lasting city, but we are looking for the city that is to come. The truth is we are citizens of two worlds, citizens of this fleeting and transitory world, but also citizens of another world, a world which is permanent and lasting and eternal. So how then shall we live? What's to be our attitude toward this dual citizenship? Is it possible? It could be an attitude of stewardship and growth, of joy and life, of grasping hold of the possibilities and potential of each moment, of each situation, even though we know it won't last. Here we have no lasting city. But while it lasts, while it lasts, let's use this world, let's care for this world and all the opportunities it provides for love and for life and for fellowship. We don't own our lives. We hold our lives in trust for God. Like the servants in the parable of Jesus who are entrusted with bags of gold, the idea is to see what we can do with it, what we can make out of this treasure of life which is given into our care. It is to affirm the essential goodness of life. It's like the flight of a sparrow. Here we have no lasting city. But while at last God calls us to love this world and to work for the health and growth of God's people and God's kingdom. I heard the story of a rather eccentric evangelist at a revival meeting. After denouncing the world and painting for his congregation the glories of heaven, he cries out, hands up everyone who wants to go to heaven. And everybody puts their hands up except for one man sitting in the front pew. And the evangelist glares at him and cries out, hands up everyone who wants to go to hell. But the man in the front pew still keeps his hand by his side. So the preacher points at this difficult parishioner and says, what about you, friend? You didn't put your hand up for heaven? You didn't put your hand up for hell? Where do you want to go? And the man says, I don't want to go anywhere. I like it here. Well, we do like it here. It's good. It contains moments of intimacy and joy and laughter. And God gives us life to make something of ourselves, to learn, to grow, to explore the mysteries of who we are and who God is and our purpose for being here. And all of life is a gift. And all of life flows from the goodness of God. And all of life is sacramental. We're not here for long. We're not here forever. Things, things grow old or change. But while we're in this moment, God invites us to love and enjoy it, even knowing that it will not last. Eventually, Inevitably, we always have to let go. One of the greatest tasks for us to learn and accomplish in life on this planet is to be able to learn to let go, to let go in gracefulness, in hope, and in faith. Jesus said, in my Father's house are many mansions. This life, this moment is only one mansion. There are many more rooms for us to explore. Sometimes late at night, alone in the all-encompassing darkness, we are afraid. Afraid of the future. Afraid of the impermanence of life. Afraid of the unknown. Afraid of death. But the last word on life is not fear. Nor is the final word either fleeting or transient. The last word about this life is not change or decay or death. The last word on life is God's word. The word that is a promise. God will never leave us. The last word is God's word of hope 
and faith and love. As the writer to the Hebrews reminds us, here we have no lasting city, but we are looking for the city that is to come. Let us pray. And now unto God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be all praise, honor, and glory, world without end. Amen.